Hi, I'm Dennis Lehane. Welcome to BetweenTheLines.co.uk. This is um, my new book, The Given Day, which uh, would explain my five-year hiatus. Um, this is a book about 1919, about an event called the Boston Police Strike, in which the entire Boston Police Department walked off the job and left a city unprotected. Um, it is the story of a white policeman and a black factory worker. Um, who gets swept up in an um, extremely tumultuous time, a time of radicals, anarchists, um, terrorist bombing, um, uh, an attack on American civil liberties by its own government, um, a time of strikes, of um, political assassinations, the great influenza, and even a molasses flood. And you have to read the book to know what I mean by that. So um, this is a given day. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's uh, as exciting uh, to read as it was to write. Danny left the boarded up room of Salutation Street and crossed the city with his flask. Just before dawn, he made his way up onto the Dover Street Bridge and stood looking out at the skyline, at the city caught between dusk and day under a scud of low clouds. It was limestone and brick and glass, its lights darkened for the war effort, a collection of banks and taverns, restaurants and bookstores, jewelers and warehouses and department stores and rooming houses, but he could feel it huddled in the gap between last night and tomorrow morning, as if it had failed to seduce either. At dawn, a city had no finery, no makeup or perfume. It was sawdust on the floors, the overturned tumbler, the lone shoe with a broken strap. Voices came from his right and he turned and saw them, the first gaggle of morning migration heading out of South Boston and up onto the bridge, women and children going into the city proper for work. He walked off the bridge and found a doorway in a failed fruit wholesaler's building and watched them come, first in clumps and then in streams. Always the women and children first, their shifts an hour or two before the men's so they could return home in time to get dinner ready. Some chatted loudly and gaily, others were quiet or soggy with sleep. The older women moved with palms to their backs or hips or other aches. Many were dressed in the coarse clothing of mill and factory workers, while others wore the heavily starched black and white uniforms of domestics and hotel cleaners. Some children were herded up Dover by two older women who scolded them for crying, for scuffling their feet, for holding up the crowd, and Danny wondered if they were the eldest of their families, sent out at the earliest age to continue the family tradition, or if they were the youngest and money for school had already been spent. He saw Nora then. Her hair was covered by a handkerchief tied off behind her head, but he knew it was curly and impossible to tame, so she kept it short. He knew by the thickness of her lower eyelids she hadn't slept well. He knew she had a blemish at the base of her spine, and the blemish was scarlet red against pale white skin and shaped like a dinner bell. He knew she was self-conscious about her Donegal brogue and had been trying to lose it ever since her father had his father had carried her into the Coughlin household five years ago on Christmas Eve after finding her half-starved and frostbitten along the Northern Ave docks. She and another girl stepped off the sidewalk to move around the slower children, and Danny smiled when the other girl passed a furtive cigarette to Nora, and she cupped it in her hand and took a quick puff. He thought of stepping out of the doorway and calling to her. He pictured himself reflected in her eyes, his eyes swimming with booze and uncertainty. Where others saw bravery, she would see cowardice, and she'd be right. Where others saw a tall, strong man, she'd see a weak child, and she'd be right. So he stayed in the doorway. He stayed there and fingered the button in his pants pocket until she was lost in the crowd heading up Dover Street. And he hated himself and hated her too for the ruin they'd made of each other.